The American force was returning to base. Their losses had been brutal, with maybe half the SPDs returning in a serviceable condition. But as they began entering the pattern, the fleet's AAA opened up with a vengeance. The American pilots swiveled their heads to see what they were shooting at, only for their hearts to sink. Hiryu's first deck load strike of 18 vowels and 6 zeros had tailed the returning aircraft back to their carriers and had now commenced a ferocious attack. The men of Hiryu's air group were elites. While Akagi and Kaga had been renowned throughout the Air Corps as torpedo specialists, it was Hiryu and Zuikaku who were famous for their dive bombers. Yamaguchi's pilots pressed the attack with a fury. The American combat air patrol desperately tried to fend them off. They shot through the escorting zeros, downing three for the loss of one wildcat, and once through the fighters, they then tore into the bombers. Eleven of the eighteen vows were cut down by the Yorktown sisters, with two more falling to the AAA, but the remaining five pressed their attack. The Japanese held their dives to an almost suicidal altitude. They couldn't miss. Three direct hits tore through USS Yorktown, while two near misses caused critical shock damage below the waterline. It had cost them almost their entire attacking force, but one US carrier was now out of action. But for the Americans, it was not for nothing. During this attack, the scouting patrols launched from Yorktown had spotted Hiryu. And with that, the stage was set. And as though an omen of what was to come, as the damage control teams aboard Yorktown extinguished the fires and restored power to the engines, they hoisted a new signal flag from their island. A full-scale, capital building-sized American flag, Old Glory herself, unfurled from the foremast and caught the blowing breeze of a carrier once again underway. What remained of Yorktown's air group rearmed and combined with bombing six aboard Enterprise, and with grim purpose, Big E turned into the wind at flank speed. The ragged band of naval aviators still alive with their hurriedly patched aircraft forged ahead into the setting sun. The final showdown was upon them. But unfortunately for USS Yorktown, it would be Hiryu who hit first. While the Americans had launched their dive bombers earlier, they had to climb to altitude and form up, giving Yamaguchi time to launch his second wave. This follow-up attack was led by the same man who had started the battle hours before. It was fitting that the man who begun the Battle of Midway should also be the man to lead off the battle's end. Joichi Tomonaga, the leader of Hiryu's air group, launched with the remaining B-5N unit, a total of 10 bombers and 6 zeros. The very last Japanese aviators available knew that their chances were slim to none of survival. They were screwed. But believing Yorktown to have been sunk by their comrades earlier, they were determined to sink Enterprise. They followed the line of bearing laid out by their friends, and sure enough, the American task force came into view. What greeted their eyes was a practically undamaged carrier flying a gigantic flag. Believing the crippled but slowly reviving Yorktown to be the Enterprise, Tomonaga and his men conducted their attack runs, lining up for a perfect concentric attack with their deadly long lance torpedoes. And it was then that the Yorktown Combat Air Patrol descended upon them. Undaunted by fighter opposition, the attack was pressed home. One after the other, the B-5Ns began their runs, only to be cut down by the Wildcats. The American pilots were frantically, desperately trying to save their ship. Then it was Tomonaga's turn. Coming in for an aft quarter attack, he lined up his shot. It couldn't miss. It was a perfect angle. But at the last minute, he was thrown off his aim by a startling jolt and a burst of flame. While focused in on his attack, Joichi was shot down by none other than Jimmy Thatch himself. In a final act of defiance and professionalism, he released his torpedo, even though he knew it would miss. Nevertheless, for the Emperor and his commander, he would carry out his orders. His wingmen, however, would see their orders through. 
sending two more torpedoes into Yorktown's side, shattering her engines and leaving her listing 23 degrees to port. The deadly long lance had claimed its victim. USS Yorktown, the defiant and doting older sister, was lost. While this tragic drama played out behind them, 10 pilots of USS Enterprise and 14 of USS Yorktown drove their SPDs onwards in search of Hiryu. Off their wing they could see plumes of smoke from their earlier handiwork and corrected their heading. Sure enough, as the sun began to set, they spotted Hiryu underway as fast as her engines could take her. Yamaguchi was trying his best. His crews, meanwhile, were feverishly cobbling together some pilots and aircraft to make an attempt on Hornet, who they thought was the only surviving US carrier. Their error would be demonstrated to them shortly. With McCluskey out of the fight wounded, it was Dick Best in command of the Americans as they prepared to brave the fighter screen. NT and Yorktown's fighters had been detailed to protect their ships from Hiryu's second wave, and so they were going in unescorted, alone. A full squadron of Zeros, orphaned from their home ships, had been rearmed aboard Hiryu and now dove in with a fury of men possessed. Anger beyond words would not describe this. They were seeking vengeance for their home ships. Three of the SPDs were blasted to shreds immediately, forcing the others to evade, throwing off their aim. But their intrepid flight leader held his course. Down and down they went, for the last time, using the rising sun painted prominently on her flight deck, Richard Halsey Best grabbed his bomb release lever and pulled it savagely. His wingmen did the same at almost the same instant. As they swooped over the edge of her deck, four 1,000 pounders shattered the forward section of Hiryu completely, caving in her deck and setting her alight from bow to the back of the island. The resulting chain reaction of fires began detonating ordnance and aircraft in the hangar deck. But due to the aggressive but convenient remodeling done by the US Navy, the hangar deck was no longer enclosed and so the catastrophic fuel air explosions that doomed the other ships did not occur. But it was apparent that she was most definitely beyond saving. The second wave of SPDs thought so too as they aborted their dives to attack Hiryu's escort. However, the rushed attack and more effective manoeuvring of the smaller ships prevented any further losses. Nevertheless, the damage was done. The American pilots dove to the water and hauled ass away, while the Zeros, with no field to land on, ditched near friendly vessels once out of fuel. As the sun burned orange on the horizon, the American aviators returned to their carriers. Yorktown's pilots eyed their home in her final moments, with a sombre sadness before landing on Enterprise. The day had started with 233 aircraft spread across three carriers. By its end, only 124 aircraft remained. Many of those damaged or written off completely, with one of their carriers sunk. To put it bluntly, combined with the losses from Midway Island, 50% of the American force was destroyed. Though Yorktown's crew survived, but the damage they had done to the Japanese was far greater. The Japanese had lost 3,000 sailors and airmen. All four fleet carriers had been sunk, along with their attached air groups who had been robbed of their place to land. The core of Japan's naval aviation arm had been demolished, with the pilots, mechanics and fitters dying in the conflagrations that had swept through the hangar bays of Kido Butai. Admiral Nagumo had abandoned Akagi and began withdrawing to regroup with Admiral Yamamoto. Admiral Yamaguchi, meanwhile, was still aboard Hiryu. Watching his command begin to disintegrate, he gave a speech to the assembled crew. He praised them for their hard work and heroism in, in partially redeeming the Navy's honour. And that the failure of this defeat was the responsibility of bad leadership, not that of its sailors and airmen. With Nagumo and Yamamoto withdrawing, Yamaguchi felt it proper that for this failure, as the senior officer left on the field, he should be the one to atone for it. He ordered all young men and men with families to abandon ship. 
本官と運命を共にする覚悟である私も上官とご一緒しますよかろう一緒に月見でもしよう総員退官The next day, Hideyu was found adrift by a scout aircraft from Hosho, as seen in this photograph. Soon after this photo was taken, she slipped below the waves. Seeing the carrier force destroyed and not wanting to risk the flagship. <laughs> Yamamoto ordered a general retreat back to Japanese waters. Enterprise would leave them a parting gift. As the Japanese fleet turned back, the US Navy's aviators gave chase, and as they did so they spotted the Mogami-class cruiser Mikuma and launched a devastating aerial attack. Enterprise's SPDs scored five hits on the forward half of the ship, starting fires and blowing the forecastle completely apart. Two of the escorting destroyers, Arashio and Asashio, took one bomb each, starting fires and killing a substantial number of their crews. Mikuma, with the damage she sustained, slowly took on water, listing to port until eventually capsizing, sinking into the abyss. They would not be the first Japanese warships to face the wrath of American air power, and they would definitely not be the last. With Yamamoto withdrawing and the US fleet returning to Pearl as the sun set on June 6, 1942, the most pivotal battle in the Pacific War came to a close, and thus the balance of history was forever changed. Despite being a strategic and tactical victory for the United States, however, operationally speaking, the Battle of Midway was, on the grand scheme of things, a draw. The Japanese still had several light carriers as well as Shokaku and Zuikaku, not to mention the other fleet carriers currently under construction in Japan or nearing completion. With the loss of Yorktown and with the other commitments to the European theatre, the United States had roughly the same carrier capability as the Japanese did. What Midway had achieved was to even the odds, and one thing was apparent to both Yamamoto and the American Joint Chiefs. Successful defensive actions only avert defeat. They do not achieve victory. To achieve victory, you have to take the offensive and seize the initiative. And with the momentum now gained, Fleet Admiral Ernest King determined that it was time for exactly that. The game had now changed. It was no longer a game of dice with long odds. The game was now poker. And granted he had a pair of fives. But the thing about American officers, which the Japanese never really worked out, is they really like to bluff. And what better way to up the stakes than to hit the enemy where he was strongest to show him you know no fear. Not to mention you get to steal his shit. The Americans were determined. They were going to get in this thing for real, and they knew just how they were going to do it. Little could they realize just how historic their campaign would be, as it would define the story of the early war into the Pacific well into the next century. Their mission was to take a large island in the Solomons by the name of Guadalcanal. They called it Operation Watchtower. Stop! Wait a minute. Wrong enterprise, wrong war. Give me a second. Uh, yeah. There we go.
As we know, during the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Japanese occupied the island of Tulagi as a strategic outpost to bolster their move down the Solomon's Island chain in support of their final offensive to seize New Guinea. Uh, but as an Australian, allow me to say, suck it, bitches! <clears throat> anyway. However, due to the intervention of the US Navy, they now had to assault the Australian force holding the island directly, resulting in them being held and then forced back up the Kokoda Trail. Again, eat shit. Given this fact, along with the cataclysmic defeat at Midway, Yamamoto decided that since he couldn't use carriers, he was going to have to use island airfields to give his naval aviators the ability to strike allied ships. Tulagi was not suited for such an undertaking. It simply wasn't big enough. But the neighbouring island of Guadalcanal had an ideal location for a large airstrip named Lunga Point. From here, utilising the exceptional range of the lightweight Japanese aircraft, they could hit targets ranging from New Guinea to Vanuatu, and provide a springboard into New Caledonia and maybe even Fiji and American Samoa. If the Japanese achieved this, it would cut the United States off from Australia, rendering them without a huge, well-developed forward operating base to launch offensives into the Empire. Fleet Admiral King and Nimitz knew that losing Australia would devastate their plans and force them to launch cross-Pacific offensives with extended lines of supply and despite their recent victories, they were still desperately short of what they needed. With the intel that Japan was setting up a base on Guadalcanal, things became clear. Letting the Japanese complete this airfield, and then allow them the ability to occupy the rest of the nearby islands, was unacceptable. They were going to do a little bit of a, what we politely call, real estate acquisition. But where do you get troops for this operation? The Navy had successfully managed to hold their own at the Battle of Midway, and were even now getting the ships together. Enterprise, Wasp, and Saratoga were ready with the carrier force, along with the brand new battleship North Carolina, later to be joined by her sister Washington. They had cruisers and destroyers aplenty, including one impetuous destroyer by the name of USS Laffey, as well as cruisers San Francisco, Salt Lake City, Portland, Atlanta, and Minneapolis. Naval strength was definitely not an issue. But troops is another matter entirely. So they got to thinking, where are we going to get the troops from? Could MacArthur do it? No, his men are dug in with the Australians in New Guinea. What about the new boys back in the States? No, apparently they have some big operation in Africa coming up. I don't know, maybe we could ask our allies. The Aussies are busy, sure, but the Brits can help, right? No, they're already in Africa. Not to mention they're trying to hold the Burma Road to keep China alive. <sighs> Shit, we're running out of options. Who does that leave? Oh, right, Canada! I'll give the Canadians a call. Hey guys, yeah, I'm gonna need to borrow your army right quick. They're busy. It's you, Canada. What what could your troops possibly be doing? What do you mean they're invading France next week? Are you fucking kidding? This is just great. We have an offensive all ready to go and no army to launch it with. Well, we don't have an army. But there is the uh other option. Who? The Dutch? They already got run out of their colonies. There's no way they could do Like, what? They can't do it. There's not enough Pacific Islanders. Wait. No. No, 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 no. I refuse. The Japanese are committing enough war crimes for the both of us. They're the ones launching suicidal attacks and pulling off crazy shit we aren't calling them we if we call those guys we'd be lucky if there was an airfield left for us to even take i i'm not i'm not going to be responsible for the humanitarian crisis we're going to cause if we call them oh god we don't really have to call them do we yeah uh yeah we do oh god fucking Thank you.
On the 7th of August 1942, under the cover of a tropical storm in the middle of the night, the United States Marine Corps entered into the waters off Guadalcanal and Tulagi. The channel of water they were sailing in would soon come to be known as Iron Bottom Sound for reasons that will become apparent. As the sun came up, the United States Navy bombarded the Japanese defences on Tulagi and Guadalcanal, while the Marines boarded their landing craft. Over their heads were the aircraft of Enterprise and Saratoga. It was a good thing they were there. The moment the Japanese realised what was happening, Japanese Naval Air Service aircraft launched from their base at Rabaul and Lai to attack the invasion fleet. Men like Japanese ace Saburo Sakai were part of this force. They were the major elite cadre left after the Battle of Midway, members of what was called the Tainan Air Group. A furious air battle ensued as the Zeros and Wildcats set upon each other like beasts possessed, while the Japanese bombers dove in on their fleet. However, due to the efforts of Enterprise and Saratoga, only two ships were damaged for the cost of 36 Japanese aircraft, while they had lost only 14 of their own in the defence. Once again, the carriers had done their job and the Marines were safely ashore. It was now time for the bloody business of the day. One day on this channel, I would love to cover the Guadalcanal campaign in full, but as this is about Enterprise, I'll have to go with a heavily abbreviated version until we get to the major naval engagements around the island involving carriers. I highly recommend for the surface actions once again, if you haven't already by now, go visit Drakinafell. Please. Anyway, the Marines did what Marines are born and raised to do. And the garrison defending the airfield quite sensibly ran into the jungle screaming in panic. After being shelled by the US Navy, picking a fight with a loose assembly of mentally challenged teenagers with machine guns led by men like John Bassalone seemed like a rather poor decision. With this victory, the Americans had themselves an airfield, and as our crayon consuming friends had achieved the honour, they got to name it, subsequently naming it Henderson Field, after the aforementioned man who led the do-or-die charge of marine pilots at Midway. But while the Japanese army was not feeling very much like a fight, the Japanese navy was eager for a little bit of well-deserved payback. After all, their finest fighting force was mercilessly cut down by the very same task force now attacking them here. Given that their biggest airbase in the region, Rabaul, was at the very top of the island chain, via a channel which would become known as the slot, while their fleet headquarters in the Pacific was located in Truck Lagoon nearby, all of these Japanese bases and assets were perfectly placed. They had an opportunity to hit the Americans and hit them really fucking hard. In the middle of the night on the 8th of August 1942, a surface force under the command of Vice Admiral Mikawa closed in on the cruisers and destroyers protecting the transport fleet which were still offloading supplies to the marines on the surrounding islands. Given the ferocious response by the Japanese Naval Air Service against the invasion force, Admiral Fletcher had withdrawn Enterprise, Saratoga and Wasp to replenish their air groups and, you know, keep them alive. He also had the full intention of expediting the offload process so he could completely withdraw and reorganise while their role was assumed by the marine air group soon to arrive at Henderson Field. The Americans had not expected the Japanese to mount a counter-attack until perhaps a week from now. But despite their code-breaking and intelligence assets, like their enemies, the Americans did not truly understand or comprehend the nature of the foe they were fighting yet, at least not fully. If a Japanese military force can attack in any way, no matter how hopeless, they most certainly will. And given that the Japanese surface force was trained and developed with the assistance of the Royal Navy in the early part of the century, all while being merged with the ancient warrior spirit of the Japanese culture, their gunnery, discipline and aggression were on a whole different level. And with the assumption that they were going to be outnumbered and outproduced, they focused on training to overcome the odds, specifically through small-scale night attacks. 
What hit the Americans that night around Savo Island was the true face of the Japanese Navy. While their aviators were the focus of Yamamoto's faction, the surface proponents had dominated for most of the IJN's development. They were as terrifying as they were ruthless. They carved into the American formation, firing at point-blank range, delivering blow after devastating blow, and once complete, the Japanese vanished seamlessly into the night. As though they were ghosts. Faced with the loss of four cruisers sunk, one damaged and two destroyers barely still afloat, the US Navy was forced to withdraw, leaving the Marines to fend for themselves. With the US Navy out of the way, the way was open for the Japanese to reinforce the island, and Admiral Yamamoto knew that if he could throw the Americans back from their first offensive move, it could perhaps give them some leverage morale-wise, and maybe even some political capital to bargain with. And so, with rare, and I mean really rare, cooperation from the army, the Japanese committed fully to the campaign. Japanese reinforcements began landing all throughout August. Along the Teneru River, near the eastern perimeter of Henderson Field, the Japanese landed a detachment of 917 men in an attempt to flank the defending marines, as they had been fortifying to the west, expecting an assault from the Japanese main force. However, the Japanese underestimated just how many marines had been landed, as well as how well dug in they were. What ended up happening was a disastrous night attack, where those 900 Japanese soldiers attacked 3,000 Marines of the 1st Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division. And despite how much shit we give our Marine Corps friends, there is one thing you can't deny. When you want a professional, well-organized fighting force to carry out political policy through violence, you call the army. When you need new real estate and an enemy dead, and I mean really dead, you call the Marines. For the loss of 44 men, the US Marine Corps essentially wiped out the entire detachment. Given this failure, the Japanese landed the rest of their reinforcements in an attempt to stabilize the situation. They were, along with the rest of their units on the western side of the island, preparing to launch an offensive to take back Henderson Field. But it was apparent more men were needed. Amru Yamamoto, though, was way ahead on the curve on that score as he had sourced the rest of the Japanese division already ashore, as well as an elite detachment of Japanese Special Navy landing forces. This was soon to be a Marine versus Marine engagement. We were about to reach levels of war crime previously thought impossible. But this force had one other motive. If this convoy was to go through unmolested, it would jeopardize the entire American operation. Thus, the US Navy would have to contest it which would almost certainly draw out Enterprise and her friends. Assigned to the task force were none other than the sisters, Shokaku and Suikaku, along with Mutsu, Kirishima and Hiei. With battle wagons as a vanguard, repairs complete and new air wings on board, the Battle of the Eastern Solomons was about to begin. by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But to secure these rights, governments are instituted among them, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Yamamoto, as usual, was correct in his operational assessment. Upon reports of the battle at Teneru, and the arrival of still more Japanese army units, Admiral Fletcher realized that if the marines were going to survive, they needed his aircraft and they needed them quickly. The Cactus Air Force, as it would be famously known, had only just received its first squadrons, numbering only 20 or so aircraft. Worse still, 
Wasp was low on fuel and stores due to being smaller than Enti and Sarah. As such, she needed to be detached from the task force. With the grim determination of an unwanted but essential mission, the two other carriers and the surface fleet did a U-turn and headed straight back into harm's way. The Japanese knew they were coming too. A scout aircraft had spotted the US task force, but before it could radio the position, Enterprise's fighters sent it screaming down in a ball of flame. If it had crashed or suffered a failure, it would have radioed for help. So when they didn't return, Nagumo, yep, him again, made an out-of-character correct assessment that had been shot down by US carrier aircraft. These suspicions were confirmed when a PBY Catalina spotted their own force. They immediately reversed course upon sighting this, and sure enough, a few hours later in the space they would have been, came a strike force from Saratoga. With a new day beginning, August 24th, 1942, both sides prepared for battle. And as the sun rose over the Pacific, if I may borrow the words of Saratha Conan Doyle, the game, Mrs. Hudson, is afoot. It was Nagumo who made the opening move. The light carrier Ryuho was under the command of Chuichi Hara, the man who led the Japanese fleet at Coral Sea. This ship was ordered to move ahead of the main force with the heavy cruiser Tone and two destroyers, Amatsukaze and Tokitsukaze. Their job was to act as a decoy vanguard to draw the Americans to battle without revealing 5th Carrier Division's location. While doing this, they were also able to neutralize Henderson Field with an airstrike comprised of Ryuho's air group and the Japanese Naval Air Service units launching from Rabaul. However, while en route to their launch point, the Vanguard group was spotted by a PBY Catalina and their position was radioed to Fletcher. The time was 9.35, and this was the first solid intel that the Americans had received regarding a carrier group. But it was only a singular light carrier with a small surface escort. Yesterday, they had seen a huge invasion convoy, and while they hadn't seen 5th Carrier Division, they had a pretty good suspicion that they were around. Then again, there was a Japanese surface force right next to Henderson Field with no protection. Every instinct Fletcher had told him this was a trap, but the opportunity to take out Ryuho without opposition was seriously tempting. He stepped up Enterprise's scouting effort and decided to play it cool. He would wait for the Japanese to make their move, which of course, true to form, Chuichihara did. He, after all, much preferred being on the offensive, and at 12.20 Ryuho launched 6 B5Ns and 15 Zeros to attack Henderson Field as planned. However, what wasn't planned was a storm front coming down the island chain, resulting in Rabaul's air group being forced to return to base. Meaning that the light carrier air group was now heading to into the target on their own, which meant consequentially the upcoming air battle would be fought on an even basis. As they approached the island, Saratoga's radar picked them up, which fixed Ryuho's exact location. Fletcher, seeing that battle was joined, decided to take a risk. He knew the Japanese force was most likely out there, but with the airfield under attack and a Japanese surface group so close, he could no longer ignore it. Saratoga's air group spooled up, and at 1340, 38 aircraft launched off her deck, heading into the fray, searching for Ryuho and her escorts. At 14.23, the Japanese air group began their attack on Henderson Field, only to run headlong into the Marine aviators of the Cactus Air Force. And just like their ground-pounding cousins in First Marines, VMF-223, who incidentally fly aviate harriers these days, were absolute maniacs. Three B-5Ns and three Zeros were blasted out of the sky with the loss of only three of their own Wildcats. Just a side note about the Cactus Air Force. These men were so competitive with their kill counts that when one of the leading aces got sick with fever, he requested the other leading ace be grounded so they could keep the scores even. But the heroics of our crayon dieted friends, while impressive, were not enough to prevent what happened next. At 1425, while the melee over Henderson Field played out, a Japanese recon aircraft spotted the American main force, and while Enterprise's fighters promptly obliterated it, the radio operator had managed to signal Nagumo their location. Zoikaku and Shokaku immediately launched their first wave strikes. 27 D3A VALs and 15 Zeros launched and began flying straight towards the American fleet. But as they made their way out, they noticed two SPD Dauntlesses flying towards them. Scouting 6 from Enterprise 
had now just found the Japanese main force. They attempted to radio back the location, however due to communication problems, these reports didn't make it through. This wasn't a good situation with all these Japanese aircraft around, not to mention all of the escorts. But being Enterprise pilots and not wanting to waste their bombs, the two SPDs decided to have a crack at it anyway, and immediately dived through the hailstorm of AAA onto Shokaku. They released their bombs, but unfortunately they went wide, only causing minor shock damage. That said, it forced five of the attacking Zeros to abandon their escort mission to chase them. But while they got the hell out of Dodge, the two Japanese fleet carriers launched their second follow-on wave right after the first, numbering 27 more VALs and 9 Zeros. The Japanese had now committed all of their aircraft to battle. The contest was now, for better or worse, in the hands of the airmen. At the same time, that being 1600, Saratoga's pilots had located Ryuho and commenced their attack. The light carrier, having launched their air wing at Henderson Field, did not have a combat air patrol to cover their group, and thus a veritable hailstorm of bombs descended upon them. Ryuho was torn apart, with 120 of her crew killed and her flight deck absolutely trashed. Her hangar bays and machinery spaces were ablaze, and it was clear to the damage control teams that she didn't have long. Chuichi Hara gave the order for the destroyers to come alongside for an abandoned ship once the Americans had cleared out. That was 1-0 to the Americans. However, while this was underway, the Japanese were about to make their big play. Enterprise's radar picked up Shokaku and Suikaku's air group, approaching the task force at 1602. At that point, Enti and Sarah had cleared their flight decks of all aircraft via emergency launch. The SPDs, fully armed with bombs, fled out to the north of the battle area, under orders to search and destroy any Japanese ship in sight. The Wildcats, meanwhile, all 53 of them, were ordered to intercept and destroy the incoming attack. But like with Scouting 6 before, communications were patchy and the vectors infrequent. It was hard to clarify what altitude the attackers were at, as well as their precise line of bearing. So when the engagement began, the Wildcats were abeamed to the Japanese formation at the same altitude, and upon sighting this state of affairs, the Zero escorts placed themselves between them and the bombers. While this put the Americans in an excellent attack position once through the fighter screen, they wouldn't be able to hit the vowels until after they had launched their attack. The Japanese dive bombers moved on their targets, but due to their ingress route, they had ended up with the carriers at different instances and angles, and it was Enterprise who was the nearest carrier. Given this, and the heavy resistance from both Flak and the Wildcats, who were even now boring in on them, the entire Japanese air group chose to attack Enterprise. The first section of Vals dove in, lining up their targets squarely in sight. However, Enterprise's helmsman obviously had something in his coffee that morning. With her aircraft all airborne and at full speed, Enti threw herself around like a destroyer. All nine of the first wave of attackers missed their target, with no damage sustained to any part of the ship. However, the second wave of Vals adjusted onto her maneuvers and launched an attack which would very nearly prove fatal. The first bomber, flown by a petty officer, Kyoto Furata, planted a delay action armor piercing bomb next to the aft elevator, which went right into the bowels of the ship, rupturing the hole below the waterline. Thankfully, however, the hole was only cracked and not blown open, meaning it would only cause a slight list. The next bomb was dropped by its petty officer Tamotsu Akimoto. This one smacked into the 5 inch gun battery next to the aft elevator, causing a secondary explosion through the ammunition locker, killing all of the crews in that part of the ship, starting a massive blaze. However, the final and most crippling bomb in terms of operations came from petty officer Kazumi Hori, who dropped a 500 pound bomb right on Enterprise's forward flight deck blowing a 10-foot hole and causing severe shock damage. Seeing these attacks, the other attackers believed that Enti was finished and switched their attack to North Carolina. However, the evasive moves combined with the heavy AA defenses prevented any more damage. Things were looking bleak. However, it was the heroism of the American damage control teams who saved the day, as anything that could threaten Enterprise's seaworthiness was immediately patched. While she had taken a pummeling, she would not sink, and with a little bit of TLC, she could be made ready for action once again. Meanwhile, for this limited success, the Japanese paid a very high price. Of the 37 aircraft that attacked the American fleet, 25 were destroyed, 
all with their pilots being lost in the process. This was on top of the loss of Ryuho and her entire air group. The Americans weren't finished yet though. A flight of SPDs from Saratoga spotted the Japanese seaplane tender Shitose and crippled her with two near misses, causing horrific shock damage to her hull. She would eventually be forced back to Japan for repairs. This ended up being the parting shot as the second wave of Japanese aircraft were unable to find their target due to the ongoing chaos on their comms and being forced to return to base. The next day, when the Japanese reinforcements attempted to approach Guadalcanal, it would have to do so without the protection of Ryuho or the main body, as both their air groups were horrifically mauled. The result was predictable. The Cactus Air Force, along with B-17 support, savaged the Japanese fleet, with fully laden troop transport and a destroyer being sunk, while the other vessels were strafed along their decks. What was worse for the Japanese is that as their carrier had been rendered inoperable and US air casualties were so low, Enterprise's air group had taken up residence at Henderson Field and they too joined in the fun. The Japanese, realizing that going ahead was surely to be a costly affair, turned around and withdrew. The Americans had once again blunted the mighty katana of Japanese naval aviation. But Enterprise was looking worse for the wear. Her air group marooned on Guadalcanal, while some of her fighters had taken up residence on Saratoga, she limped back to Pearl Harbor for much-needed repairs on September 12, 1942. When she pulled into dry dock, like Yorktown, it was a general consensus she would need months in maintenance and a complete refit to be up to scratch. But yet again, due to the shortage of carriers, she was needed far sooner. This situation only got worse, as on September 15th, USS Wasp was torpedoed by Japanese submarine I-19 and sunk. This meant Saratoga and Hornet were now the only ships available to keep up the fight. Things on Guadalcanal, meanwhile, were not going much better. Marine General Vandegrift was receiving reports that a large Japanese offensive was being prepared to the west of the Matanikau River. While the Americans had forced the Imperial Japanese Navy back during the day, they still owned the night, and given that Japanese destroyers and cruisers were capable of high rates of knots, they had formed a nighttime ferry service for Japanese troops, which was quickly dubbed the Tokyo Express. They couldn't ship heavy weapons as the cargo ships were too slow, and they would be intercepted by the Cactus Air Force unless they had cover. But small arms, mortars, machine guns, and light guns could be shipped via the Tokyo Express. It was in this dire circumstance that the marines at Guadalcanal performed a ritual. A ritual which is still practiced today as seen in this clip from BBC's Planet Earth. And here we see a herd of North American marines, commonly known as a gaggle fuck. They are currently in the process of performing a tribal dance. Many misinterpreted for a mating ritual. It is in fact the process of summoning the ghost of Chesty Puller, a deity for their tribe. <laughs> this Chesty Puller, though, was not a spirit, but the man, the myth, the legend himself. He had arrived just in time as well. There was a brief lull in the fighting due to bad weather up and down the island chain. Both sides used it to reinforce and regroup. The Americans won a small victory against a Japanese surface group at the Battle of Cape Esperance, but other than that, nothing much happened combat-wise. That said, during a nighttime counterattack launched by Japanese troops against the Marines at the mouth of the Botanikau River, near Lunga Point, the Marines were forced to pull back and were on the verge of being overrun. Chesty ordered his men to fall back to the shoreline in order to get rescued by the Navy. At that moment, the only Medal of Honor to ever be won by a Coast Guardsman was earned, as Signalman Douglas A. Munro, having volunteered for this dangerous duty, willingly positioned his landing craft between the Japanese and his comrades, now evacuating the Marines. He then proceeded to single-handedly engage the entire Japanese force with a 30 cal machine gun by himself before being mortally wounded. However, this small action, while massive heroism was demonstrated, was only one battle. Logistically, however, things were seriously moving. The Cactus Air Force now numbered 71 aircraft, while the whole of 1st Marines was now ready to kick some ass. It wouldn't be easy though. 
as Yamamoto had arrayed everything in the area against them. Army reinforcements, Japanese marines, and now the entirety of the Congo class, as well as Shokaku and Suikaku. Not to mention the new conversion carriers Junyo and Hiyo, as well as the light carrier Zuiho. As my old cadet drill instructor used to say, defecation was about to collide with oscillation. Congo and Haruna bombarded Henderson Field, while a gigantic Japanese land offensive was launched all along the southern perimeter. On the 24th of October, and over the next two days, Chesty Puller's Marines of the 1st Battalion, 7th Marine Regiment, along with their other comrades in 1st Marine Division, fought a brutal close-in and occasionally hand-to-hand -hand fight with what was essentially the entire Japanese 17th Army, numbering 20,000 men. It was during this action that John Bassalone won his famous Medal of Honor, immortalized in the TV series The Pacific. But as this horrific scene played out, it would be in the seas just outside the Solomon Island chain, which would be the worst battle. A battle which would come to be known by the US Navy as Bloody Santa Cruz. Over the months straddling September and October, USS Enterprise, with the aid of Pearl Harbor's dry dock teams and the ever-faithful USS Vestal, was back online with her little sister Hornet, forming Task Force 61. And with her came a brand new air group, including a squadron which would go down in history as one of the finest fighter units in the US Navy, VF-10, the Grim Reapers, as well as the return of Admiral Halsey, and a new task force commander, Admiral Thomas Kincaid. With the constant movements of naval forces towards Guadalcanal and the constant pressure placed on the Marines, as soon as Enterprise was able to sail, she was heading with her little sister down to her duty station when word came down. The Marines were locked in a life or death struggle with a whole Japanese army, and that army was supported by what amounted to the entire Japanese combined fleet. As said before, Pretty much every Japanese heavy hitter was nearby, except for... Because she was just too big to fit in the shallower waters between the islands. TF-61's commander, Admiral Thomas Kincaid, was on the lookout for the Japanese fleet. He knew Nagamo was out there somewhere, waiting to strike, and he had both fleet carriers available to the US Navy with him. If he wasn't careful, this situation could deteriorate fast. He was right to be concerned. While he yo was not present due to suffering a fire before departure, Junior was steaming towards Guadalcanal with an absolute powerhouse of a surface group surrounding her, comprised of Atago, Takao, Miyoko, Maya, Congo, and Haruna, along with a substantial destroyer force. Their job was to get a sizable air group into knife fighting range to pin the Americans while their surface force could close in and wipe them out with superior firepower. Following on behind them was the main force comprised of Shokaku and Zuikaku, Hiei and Kirishima, Chikuma, Tone, Suzia and Kumano with Zuiho providing light carrier support. That's three fleet carriers and a light carrier with enough surface ships of size to eradicate any opposition they faced. It was a simple matter of arithmetic. If anything other than complete tactical surprise was achieved, the Japanese will almost certainly carry the day. And if any single wrong decision is made, or even one piece of bad luck befalls them, the entire carrier capability of the United States Navy is wiped out. And if by some horrible twist of fate they get close enough for a surface action, it's goodnight Irene for the entire task force. While the United States had more ships and higher potential combat power, in terms of concentration of force, Japan still held the advantage, and until 1943 comes round with a fully geared up war economy, any losses here would be devastating. But abandoning Guadalcanal and perhaps losing Australia and New Zealand is equally unacceptable. And as Admiral Halsey was in charge, being on the defensive was not going to happen. And so Kincaid committed to the battle, with scouting flights from both carriers and shore-based Catalinas, the hunt was on. In the early dawn of the 26th of October 1942, Chesty Puller and his men checked their lines and took stock of the aftermath. They had held Henderson Field, and in front of their lines lay the remains of an entire Japanese force. 3,000 men cut down by the guns of 1st Marines. 
with the loss of only 80 Americans. A total victory which would pass into the annals of legend. But out to sea, the vicissitudes of fate were ensuring that balance was maintained. A radar-equipped PBY had spotted Nagumo's main body early in the morning at around 3am. However, due to yet more communications issues, Admiral Kincaid did not get the signal until two hours later. As such, when given this intelligence, he assessed quite rightly that the Japanese would have changed position by now and held off launching an attack at dawn. However, had he been aware at how the Japanese had changed position, he might have reconsidered. The Japanese had either, by instinct or by luck, reversed course and closed on the Americans, so that by 6am they were within 200 miles. Given Japanese deck load strike doctrine, allowing them to mass two full waves of aircraft within minutes, the greater range and speed of said aircraft, as well as their lethal surface force, getting into close quarters rendered the Americans at a disadvantage. What would decide the matter is recon. Who would see who first? As fate would have it, they saw each other at the same time. At 6.45, a scanning flight from Enterprise spotted Nagumo's main force immediately radioing its position. Ten minutes later, a Japanese scout spotted USS Hornet and did the same. It was now a race to see who could get airborne first. Both carrier groups rushed to clear their decks of aircraft to launch a strike. While Enterprise's scouts honed in on the transmission to launch a spoiling attack, at 7.40, two SPDs from Enterprise's air group, who had been on the scouting mission, arrived over the Japanese formation while they were conducting launch operations. The surface escorts were putting up a huge flak screen, while the combat air patrol was prowling around for scouts such as them. Attacking the main body was suicide, but below them, on the periphery, they spotted the light carrier Zuiho, launching her own air group. The two Enterprise pilots decided on full send, and with the lethality they were famous for, deposited two 500 pound bombs right through the flight deck. Damage control teams extinguished the fires immediately, and the central hits prevented hull damage, but a flight deck was out of commission. But it wasn't going to be enough. The Japanese doctrine, while having limitations in protracted fights like Midway, in pure ship-to-ship -ship engagements, especially at closer ranges, it was lethal. Despite spotting the Americans after they had been spotted, it was their air groups who got airborne first. The first wave of 64 Japanese aircraft formed up in their respective units. 21 VALs, 22 B5Ns and 21 Zeros. They had launched while Enterprise's scouts were making mischief. Once they had gotten airborne, both Shokaku and Suikaku commenced launch on their second waves. 16 B5Ns, 19 VALs and 9 Zeros, not including Zuiho Zeros, which had been launched earlier when the scouts had been spotted. By 9am, the Japanese had over 100 aircraft en route to attack Hornet, with a full cap in place behind them. And worst of all for the Americans, those 100 aircraft were formed up en masse to attack in waves as their doctrine was designed. This fight was going to be a brutal one. The US force, meanwhile, was at this time still scrambling to get organized. They had no equivalent to the deck load strike doctrine, and due to the fact that a number of their dive bombers were outperforming recon while they had been caught off guard by the Japanese forces' proximity, they decided that hitting quickly was preferable to hitting hard. So both Hornet and Enterprise launched their aircraft as fast as they could, while ordering their pilots to commence their attacks as soon as able. This resulted in small flights of 20 to 30 aircraft proceeding independently to the Japanese fleet with only limited fighter escort, as the main force of Wildcats were forming the Task Force Combat Air Patrol. This posed two major issues. The first was the obvious one. It's easier to defend against three or four smaller attacks spread out over time than it is to defend against two really huge attacks back to back. The other was something that all naval aviators of World War II struggled with even under ideal conditions. Navigation across open sea, relying entirely on compass headings and airspeed over time, is incredibly difficult. One degree of angle difference exponentially decreases the chance of intercept. And given that we're talking aircraft and ships that moved at high speed, one tiny error can lead to the discrepancy in the tens, if not hundreds of miles. If you're spread out into small formations operating independently, there is a higher chance that the navigation variables will conspire against you. Which is exactly what happened. Though it must be said that with so many Japanese ships around the place, everybody at least found something to attack. 
The Battle of Santa Cruz was well underway now. And in a scene which would be comedic if the uh, fighting wasn't so depressingly fierce, the leading US force made contact with and subsequently passed the Japanese formation heading the other way. The time was 8.30am, and it was now that the fighters would join the fray. Suiho's combat air patrol had been following the raid on its way to Hornet, and seeing the American formation, they moved quickly to intercept. The Wildcats turned into the attack and knocked down four of the attacking Zeros, for the loss of three of their own in the subsequent dogfight. However, while half the Japanese fighters kept the escorts busy, the rest dove in on the bombers. Two Avengers went down, immediately followed by two SPDs. Four more bombers were heavily damaged and forced away. Between Zuiho's fighters and the combat air patrol over the fleet, there was a formidable defense to get through. But the Americans, in their typical way, pressed home the attack. By the time they were on target, only 11 SPDs had made it, and they had selected Shokaku as their prey. The AAA was intense and the Zeros kept coming, but the Dauntlesses lived up to their reputation and their name. Between three to six 500 pound bombs tore Shokaku's flight deck apart while blasting through the hangar bays and machinery spaces. However, unlike at the Battle of Midway, the hangar bays were empty and the ordnance that was brought up from the magazine was now attached to the aircraft making a beeline to Hornet. Shokaku would live. The latter would not. At the same moment, the Japanese force had been sighted on radar. 37 Wildcats moved to intercept, but the issues that had plagued the Americans during the Battle of the Eastern Solomons struck them once again. Communications were patchy, vectors inaccurate, and altitude uncertain. Only a few of the Wildcats would manage to get into attack position prior to the Japanese bombing runs commencing. However, those that did gave a good account of themselves. Several vows were shot down, while others were severely damaged, including the raid leader, Lieutenant Sadamu Takahashi. But 16 Vals and 20 B5Ns made it through unmolested and commenced their attack. During their transit, a patch of bad weather had made its way into the battle area, blanketing USS Enterprise in a rain squall, obscuring her from view, meaning that the only capital ship the Japanese flight could see was the wildly turning USS Hornet. The entire Japanese air group descended on her, the flak was biblical above the US task force, knocking down Japanese aircraft left and right. US fighters even followed the Japanese into the attack, suffering friendly fire in a vain attempt to stop them. But it wasn't enough. Three bombs struck Hornet square in the center of her flight deck. Two armor-piercing bombs detonated in the center of the ship, tearing up her interior and causing severe shock damage, while the other hit was a HE bomb, blasting a huge hole in the flight deck. There were severe casualties on Hornet, but the damage was manageable. That was until the torpedo bombers came in. The 20 B-5Ns had come in underneath the valves, evading the American combat air patrol. The anti-aircraft fire was murderous. Like their opposite numbers at Midway, they were slaughtered on the way in. However, the defensive screen was not as dense as it had been on Kido Butai, and their attack was synchronized with that of the dive bombers. The flight released their torpedoes, on time, and on target. Hornet swerved to evade and succeeded in dodging a few, but she couldn't dodge them all. Two long lance torpedoes, the deadliest torpedo in the world as we know, smashed into Hornet's engineering spaces. The hole cracked open immediately like an egg, as the shock ruptured pipes and then shattered the propulsion system. Hornet slowed to a dead stop almost immediately as her insides began hemorrhaging leaving her stationary for Warrant Officer Shigeyuki Sato. Sato had been in the last wave of vows. The American gunners had thrown up a wall of shrapnel between them and the Hornet, and some of that shrapnel had hit his engine, setting it alight. With only seconds left on his aircraft's life, he decided that he would use those seconds to the fullest. As Hornet steadily ground to a halt, Sato aimed his vow right for the island, with the rage-filled scream of a warrior administering the death blow like the samurai of old, he pushed his stick forward savagely and dove straight into his target. USS Hornet's forward smokestack disappeared in a flash of flame as burning aviation fuel sprayed all over, setting the ship afire, including into the interior of the ship due to the hole in the flight deck. Damage control teams went to work and were managing to bring her back to life with the aid of the escorts and their fire hoses. 
Hornet's fires were extinguished and the emergency power was being restored. USS Northampton arrived on station quickly and began the process of towing her. But time was not in their favour, as the Japanese still had more aircraft incoming. Enterprise, meanwhile, had since emerged from the rain squall and was now recovering her aircraft. Hornet had been doing the heavy lifting attack-wise up to this point. However, Enti's Avengers and SPDs had come very close to sinking Chikuma, battering her with multiple bomb hits. The Grim Reapers, meanwhile, were doing their best, but the technical issues in the Combat Air Patrol's interception were making life very difficult for them. It was then that the second wave of Japanese aircraft arrived. Interrupting recovery operations for the first wave of aircraft, resulting in a lot of US pilots having to ditch alongside their escorts, that in turn would result in the sinking of USS Porter as the Avengers torpedo, still on board the aircraft, ran into the ship after the ditching. Meanwhile, the second wave of Japanese aircraft could now see Enterprise, and as Hornet looked done for, selected her for an attack. Once again, the Wildcats of VF-10 attempted to intercept, and once again, they only just managed to get into position after the Japanese had commenced their bomb runs. Nevertheless, they managed to shoot down two of the dive bombers before they started their attack. The other 17 would have to be halted by the gunners. Lieutenant Keichi Arima and his pilot, Petty Officer Kyoto Furata, led the attack and planted their bomb on Enterprise's forward elevator, severely jamming the mechanism in the up position. Another one of Arima's men managed to get the other bomb just aft of the island, while a near miss caused shock damage to the outer hull. It was then that the torpedo bombers arrived on scene and began lining up at different angles for a concentric attack. The Grim Reapers, though, were now organised and on station and spotted them, and immediately sent three of them down in flames, while a fourth was heavily damaged. That one launched a kamikaze strike on the USS Smith, severely damaging her and setting her ablaze. However, she wouldn't sink due to the captain being an absolute mad lad, he sailed into the wake of the battleship South Dakota, now going at flank speed to evade the incoming aircraft, and the spray of the massive blades churning the water doused the flames aboard USS Smith and saved the ship. The torpedo bombers, meanwhile, pressed their attack, but the Americans managed to evade all of their weapons and blasted most of them to pieces with AA at very close range. The attack was foiled, and things began to come back under control. But at that moment, a third wave of Japanese aircraft appeared. Junyo, having heard the fight going on, had turned about from their vanguard position and steamed back with all haste. Getting into range to launch her first wave, she duly did so, resulting in the arrival of a third wave of attackers, taking Admiral Kincaid and the Combat Air Patrol completely by surprise. Nevertheless, everyone aboard the US ships was on high alert, and the storm of anti-air that faced them caused devastation in their ranks but the Japanese airmen pressed the attack on Enterprise, causing minor damage with their many near misses. But while their physical threat was negligible, it was this attack that broke Admiral Kincaid's nerve. Realising that Japanese attack waves come in pairs, he had done the math that another force would be coming presently, which may spill over into another attack from Shokaku and Suikaku. With Hornet out of the fight and in dire straits, while Enterprise was wounded and busy recovering aircraft from both her air group and her little sisters, they were in no shape to continue the fight. Wanting to preserve his battleship and his remaining carrier, Admiral Kincaid ordered his forces to withdraw, leaving Hornet and Northampton behind. It would be the last time Enterprise saw her little sister. The Japanese were indeed preparing their final strike, but their casualties across all of their air groups had been catastrophic. Of all the senior officers launched from Junyo for the follow-up attack, only one returned. He raved incoherently about flak and fighters raining from the skies, of entire formations wiped out. It wasn't an exaggeration. Despite having done so much damage, the Japanese had lost 90 aircraft, along with most of their experienced flight crews. These were losses they couldn't hope to replace in short order. That said, there were still aircraft and pilots left. Junyo and Shokaku launched their remaining air groups for a final attack to wipe out the American fleet, to ensure their emperor a victory. When they arrived at 1520, however, 
There was no fleet to be found. The enemy had turned tail and run. But they had left behind a wounded carrier with a cruiser desperately trying to tow her to safety. Hornet had evacuated everyone except essential personnel in order to conduct damage control to try and save the ship. They had restored emergency power and were working on getting the engines back online. There was hope. That is, until they saw Junyo and Shokaku's air groups. With deliberate precision, the B-5Ns under the command of Lieutenant Ichiro Tanaka lined up for a simultaneous torpedo and level bombing strike. And sure enough, both a long lance and a rain of bombs tore Hornet asunder. With emergency power knocked out, the pumps rendered inoperable, and the engines permanently disabled, there was nothing else that could be done. The Japanese were closing in with surface ships, and more bombers would definitely arrive before the sun sets. USS Hornet's crew abandoned ship, picked up by her escorts. By midnight, the Japanese would find her, and realizing she had no value, her enemies tore her apart with a barrage of torpedoes, plunging her to the seafloor. The Battle of Santa Cruz was over. Enterprise limped away from the scene, damaged. Her dearest friend, USS Vestal, was even now preparing repair crews to get her back into shape. It was then that she received the news. USS Hornet was gone. Her little sister was dead. She was now the last surviving ship in her class. But at least they had stopped the Japanese attack. At least they had stood them off once more. But it wasn't enough. Soon after the battle, reports had begun arriving that more and more troops were landing on Guadalcanal via the Tokyo Express, and that the full might of the Congo class would once again lead a convoy down the slot to begin a final operation to seize the island. Enterprise was the only carrier in the Pacific left. Her sisters were dead. Her fellow task force members exhausted and beat up. Her countrymen, the marines who were in her care, were doomed to face annihilation. All of her sacrifices, all of the blood, her sisters' lives, all of it would be for nothing. No. This wouldn't stand. Well, the enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again. <laughs>